Hey everybody, it's Dr. D. Welcome back to uh, to our unit on hypothesis testing. We talked about the intuition. Uh, we dug into step one. Um, there are five steps in the way I formulate hypothesis testing. Uh, today we're going to cover steps two, three, and four, uh, and then we're going to we're going to have a whole separate video just on uh, step five because I think uh, that it warrants that, um, and uh, I want to give it that kind of attention. Um, but steps two, three, and four uh, usually they move along pretty briskly. Step two sometimes they um, other people put this in a different order. Oh, by the way, I just draw attention. Test of mu sigma known is where we're starting. And we'll, we'll change our assumptions and change the parameters we're estimating or uh, testing. But for now, test of one population mean where we assume that we know the population standard deviation is, is the easiest place to begin. Okay, so step two. And some people put this in a different order, but I, I, I have a strong ethical commitment to putting it here. Step two is to choose a level of significance. Um, and we're going to use the letter alpha. And in the last video, I mentioned that this can be, or maybe it was the video prior to that, this can be a little confusing because if you were just doing um, confidence intervals, um, then you used alpha for the confidence level. And now we're using the same Greek letter for the, um, for the level of significance. What's the deal? Uh, it's useful to know that that's not on purpose to make it confusing for you. Uh, alpha often culturally within mathematics and within modeling, uh, particularly human behavior, stands for a belief parameter. And so for the people that were trying to, you know, put this together, they, you know, you pick a, you want to pick a number that's going to be intuitive to, uh, to people, who, to your audience. And for most people, you know, who are, they're trying to sell this to, they're people who are already familiar with mathematics. And so they, we choose a, a, a Greek letter that hopefully will be readily understood by our audience to stand for something like how, how wh where does your belief about this stand? And so it was intended to be uh, intuitive. Um, it turns into kind of an inside outside thing, but that's not on purpose. Anyway, I've stated in the past that every number is the answer to a question. Uh, I want to point out, in this case, alpha is the answer to the following question. Um, how unlikely would a sample have to be Assuming H0 is true, so we made some hypotheses, see some hypotheses, we made some assumptions, uh, a particular assumption about the world. Assuming H0 is true for, fro, for us to stop believing that age zero is true. So the example I use when we were first talking about the intuition of, uh, of hypothesis testing is that, um, you know, let's say that I said that uh, there's only one inch of rain per year in my county, and you measured 30 randomly chosen days, and over that 30 randomly chosen days, you... Um, there's a bunch of possibilities for what you you know you average. Maybe your annualized average was uh, an inch and a quarter. Well, if I said that it's an inch and you got an inch and a quarter, is that off by enough? Um, well, maybe, maybe not. If it's two inches, is that off by enough? If it's three, if it's 12 inches? Um, essentially, if it's true that it's actually one inch, what we can say is, well, the chance of it being 12 inches is like one in a trillion, or the chance of it being 1.25 inches is actually like 25%, something like that. What alpha is measuring is that probability. How unlikely, what unlikeliness is there going to be that would yield a change in our beliefs, right? There's some line where we would say, look, this is just a line. It's too far, right? I'm not, I, I'll believe this, but only so much. And so if you're telling me that your null is true, and then I witness something that assuming the null is true is like a one in a million event, I don't know. I have to, you know, there's a conflict there and I have to decide. Um, in social sciences, you know, out, common alphas are, um, I don't know, the, the lowest value you might see is 001 in the social sciences, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, or 0 0.10. Um, in physical sciences, because those phenomena are deterministic, uh, you can have an alpha that's quite low, like six zeros or seven zeros. But um, in the social sciences, because there's so much noise, generally we uh, generally 
0.05 is the most common of these in the social sciences. One thing to keep in mind is that when we're choosing a um, when we're choosing an alpha, another thing that alpha is measuring is what proportion of our results will involve rejecting the null when it's true, right? So what proportion of our results will involve rejecting the null when it's true? And when we, if we reject the null at a 5% rate, if we say we have to witness something um, that's a 5% or less event uh, in order for us to reject the null, well, 5% events happen 5% of the time. And so one out of every 20 of our results will be it will involve rejecting the null even though uh, the null is true um, the problem is we don't know which one it is right one out of 20 but we don't know which one it, that is but so it, when you read the newspaper or you're you know following along with social science research you should know one out of every 20 results is is wrong and we just don't know you know that we just have to make that trade-off and there is a trade-off right if we're more restrictive which is here then we have stubborn nulls right We've got a null that's hard to get rid of, even if it's wrong. Right? This, even if it's like a one in five hundred chance, we're going to keep the null because we said it had to be one in a thousand. Um, down here, we're uh, we're looser, but now ten percent of our results are definitely wrong, and so it's you know there's this trade-off that we kind of have to make there. And step two is about choosing that trade-off. Um, by the way, the, when it, I mentioned this as sort of a bar bet model, or I mentioned the bar bet model, this is like stating the terms of the bet. How unlikely a sample are we going to have to observe in order for us to to change our minds? So that's step two. Usually in practice, it's pretty quick. The question just gives it to you, gives it says, use an alpha of this. And if it doesn't, you know, if you have to pick your own, you should probably pick one from here. Um, in different fields, you know, as you become culturally acclimatized, you learn what an acceptable alpha is there. Okay, that's step two. Step three is to choose a, hold on, let me bust out the pen, is to choose a test statistic. So step three. It is the case that the um, the null that we assume tells us something about the, um, the what the distribution of the world of samples should be, right? So if we collect samples and we calculate some numbers, the null is telling us what those numbers might look like. A statistic. What is a test statistic? A, a test statistic is a number you can calculate. And that's actually the statistic part, right? Anything you can calculate from a sample is a statistic. The test part is that has a oops has a nice distribution if age zero is true. So if the null is true, then there's a number we can calculate that should have a nice distribution. What do I mean by nice? Um, what I mean by nice is usually what I'm going to mean is that there's an Excel formula for it, right? Or a table somewhere, something like that. That somebody somewhere has established that, like, look, if the null is correct, then this is what you should expect to see, and this is the likelihood of seeing them, right? As a nice distribution, we could calculate, we can convert it to a probability. Now, this is going to vary by context, right? So depending on what you're testing, you're going to get different things here. In this case, since what we're looking at right now is a test of mu x, sigma x is known, then your test statistic is going to look something like this. z equals x minus, or sorry, x bar minus mu 0 divided by sigma x over the square root of n. And if the null is true, this means is distributed, this little squiggle means is distributed, then this has a standard normal. Normal with a mean of 0, a standard deviation of 1, if the null is true. Okay, so you want to add this to your little um, formula sheet or something like that. And just to lay out what all these things mean, right, we've got 
uh, x bar is the sample mean n is the sample size sigma x is the population standard deviation mu zero is the hypothetical mean right so that's the population mean under the null and then this squiggle thing it's called this it's another binary relation like greater than or less than or equal to it's called a similarity relation and just so we're clear what and then the, uh, the last thing n zero one just means standard normal so we're clear what this is saying is if the null is true, then what you can do is you can go engage in this process. You can go calculate x bar. You can go calculate n. You can go collect some data, calculate this number. From that number x bar, you subtract the mean. We have this sigma x that we assume we know. You divide that by the square root of your, um, sta uh, your sample size. And what you're going to do is you're going to generate a value that you call z. Now let's say I am some unethical person who wants to do all of the, who wants to get all the money for being a statistical consultant, but doesn't actually want to do the work. Well, what I can do is I can just go into uh, Excel and I can do, uh, I can use, um, you know, norm dot s dot inf, and then I can just plug the rand function in here, and it'll just spit out a bunch of random z statistics, right? Nobody will be any the wiser. So I'm just going to spit out a bunch of z stats. You're going to go through the hard work of collecting a sample and calculating a z stat, and then doing it again and collecting a z stat, and doing it again and collecting a z stat. What this, what the test statistic says is that if the null is true, then this, then these two processes will yield results that are indistinguishable from each other, because your hard work of going to collect a sample and then calculating the z statistics is going to generate data. It's going to generate z's that look like they were randomly drawn from a standard normal distribution. If the null is not true, and you can see why that's the case, right? So if the null is true, then that means that this mean is the true mean, right? We've got a, uh, a x bar minus mu that turns into a score formula and so if mu zero is the true mean then you're taking your sample mean you're subtracting mu x bar you're dividing by sigma x bar and you should be cranking out z stats if the null is false then what you're doing is you're taking x bar you're subtracting some random nonsense number dividing by sigma x bar which is not going to generate z's because it's not a z score formula it's a nonsense formula and so you're going to be spitting out nonsense um, numbers that do not look like z scores whereas i'm going to be because i'm just cheating i'm going to be calculating z scores and so um and so that's what this does it basically says if the null is true this will spit out z scores if the null is not true who knows what's going to happen and so that's what step three is about it's about choosing a number we can calculate that if the null is true should have a nice distribution step four then the last one we're going to talk about today we're saving step, saving step five for its own video but step four to collect data and compute the test statistic well that means we just have to come up with a value for our test statistic so if you had the test statistic if you chose it correctly and you've got x bar minus mu zero over sigma x divided by the square root of n then what you need to do is get yourself an x bar get yourself a mu zero get yourself a sigma x get yourself an n this comes from the sample as does this this comes from an assumption that's usually stated elsewhere and this comes from the null and if you take all these and put them together then out the other end you will get a z and that process getting to the z right here that is the end of step four and that leads you into step five now for those of you who have been following along since we started talking about normal distributions what i do want to draw attention to while we are here um, is that this is related to the normal distribution problems that we've dealt with in the past essentially what we're doing with steps with step one is we're uh, creating a sampling distribution that is centered at the square root at, z, at mu zero and has the sigma x bar as specified. And then what we've got is we've got some x bar, let's say just for the sake of argument, let's say it's over here. 
Um, then what we're doing is we're relating it to the z curve. You don't actually have to draw these pictures, but I want you to know that we're doing stuff that is related to what we've been doing in the past, where mu z equals 0, sigma z equals 1. This is the z curve. This z right here is this z right here, right? So what we've done with step 4 is we have finished, essentially we've finished step uh, step two we are real, of the uh, normal distribution process. We've taken our x bar, our mu zero, and our sigma x bar. And we've used it to calculate a hypothetical z. This is essentially the z if h zero is true, right? It would be a z score if h zero is true. What we're going to do next with step five is we're going to try to find the size of some area here or here and then use that to try to decide whether it means we believe that a zero is true or not. Um, but that's for next time. For today, just want to recap briefly steps two through four. Step one is to formulate hypotheses, previous video. Step two, we're choosing a level of significance alpha. We want to choose that now because if we don't, turns out later you can always game the system by choosing an alpha that gets the result you want. So the responsible thing to do is to choose it now. Um, and then there are four values you might expect to see. We're going to stick with 0.05 when in doubt, but otherwise kind of follow whatever we have presented to us. We're going to choose a test stat. We've only learned one so far, so this is pretty simple. Later on, we'll learn more. Um, we have a Z stat. And then step four is to collect the data and to plug it in and calculate the, the test statistic. Again, next time when we meet, we'll learn about p-values and conclusions. Uh, thanks for your time. If you have questions, that makes a lot of sense. Feel free to get in touch. I'm always happy to hear from you. Uh, send me a comment or an email, and I'll do my best to keep in touch. Thank you. Uh, it's Dr. D, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.